Good lunch, everybody. Um, and welcome to the Voice Over 4G panel. Uh, we're here with Akshay Sharma from Gartner, who's the moderator, and he'll leave things off. So take it away, Akshay. Okay, great. Thanks. So this uh, panel is about giving voice to 4G, and we'll, we have a distinguished panel here with uh, Dr. Mehmet Belas from GenBand, as well as Don Trzinski from Acme Packet. So what I'll do is, um, I'm from Gartner, I'm a research director involved in the carrier network infrastructure at Gartner, and I'm an analyst. And uh, what we'll do is we'll try to discuss in this panel the different flavors of how do you do voice in 4G. And there's a lot of debate right now in the industry, ranging from keeping it as 2G, as in some carriers in the U.S., to voice over IP based, to uh, various combinations thereof. So we'll, we'll have a, an interesting uh, to and fro. S question is, how do you do voice? You know, I guess we're probably not going to do the, the, uh, the string approach here, but <coughs> as I mentioned, you know, Verizon has stated initially they might keep it as 2G, CDMA. And uh, while that may work for a while, we'll see that there's other alternatives. One being perhaps GSM encapsulated over TCP IP and run that over, over the data network of 4G. That's one approach. T-Mobile is very active in that. Uh, there's a technology I'm sure we've heard of, IMS, IP Multimedia Subsystem, with voice over IP, and that's an, another approach. However, there's a whole core infrastructure that needs to be uh, upgraded in that case. We also have non-IMS based, you know, the IETF SIP or other approaches to even over the top. And we just heard today that Skype just got sold. So who knows? You know, that could be a threat to some carriers as well. Uh, or in some cases, like three in the UK have embraced Skype. So there could be some co opetition uh, on how to do it. We've heard even voice uh, over IP SIP trunking. You know, maybe a carrier does not need to deploy an entire soft switch, but maybe use a session border controllers and peer with voice over IP partners. So in this uh, panel, we'll have uh, hopefully a lively debate and hopefully good Q&A from you guys as well. We've heard about uh, fixed mobile convergence in the past, you know, coupling Wi-Fi with cellular, perhaps even wireline. Is that needed if you have multi-megabit per second pipes coming to you over 4G. However, will that be pervasive everywhere? There might be some areas of lack of coverage and maybe seamless session continuity to Wi-Fi or some other approaches may be, may be important. So we could perhaps uh, you know, even discuss that as well. If you look at Verizon's architecture, you'll see uh, this is straight out of their slides where they have session border controllers, various transit routing capabilities, least cost routing, view IP peering arrangements. The idea is maybe signaling trombones through this whole session management core, but bearer goes point to point. You know, does that, is that needed in 4G? There's concepts of peer-to-peer -peer networking even in LTE, LTE-A has this notion of a base station router. Is that going to be leveraged, perhaps? There's all kinds of, however, some you know, fundamental issues like regulatory features, CALIA, lawful intercept. How do you do that? Circuit switched aspects, circuit switched applications, pound this, pound you know, all the star codes and pound features. Do you just migrate over to IP right away? How do you do Local number portability, enum, push to talk, push to talk. Is that IMS based push to talk, or is it some of the other based uh, approaches like the IDEN phones? How do you do that? Now there's the newer features, rich communication suite, RCS has come about in IMS. Presence, how do you do that? So these are some of the newer opportunities, but there are also some technical hurdles to get there as well. So in this panel, hopefully we'll address some of these questions, and maybe you guys can fire away as well. I'll just pose some questions right now, you know, to keep in mind. What are the architecture and infrastructure choices for either an incumbent or a greenfield operator for voice? Is there a difference? 
where should service providers locate the service delivery intelligence and control? Is it in the core or is it at the edge? And what's wrong or right about each, each approach? What are the requirements for security and interoperability? Does IMS deliver everything that we need? How about FMC? Is that something that makes sense here? And what are the optimal technology choices relative to product availability? We've heard about IMS for years. Is it deployed? Is it readily available? So these are some of the questions I'll ask uh, as we go along, and I'm sure you guys will have some good questions as well. So what I'll do is I'll jump into uh, – is Mehmet? Is it good? Yeah. Okay. So I'll, I'll put this in. Okay, great. Take it away. Good afternoon. Yeah. If my voice is a little bit coarse, I apologize. Just arrived and uh, after 18 sessions last day and a half with the investors. So uh, totally different topic, of course. That's why I have a couple of notes in front of me. Uh, uh, well, uh, as you know, the consumer trends are shifting, you know, with the, with the phenomena of iPhone and uh, getting data on our cell phones uh, tremendously. The, uh, the applications such as online gaming, social networking, uh, instant messaging uh, is increasing and exploding the data, data requirements. You know, when Apple iTunes were uh, launched in April 28, 2003, since then, five billion songs have been downloaded. And, you know, another statistics, YouTube, every day there's 100 million uh, uh, videos have been viewed. Over 200 million subscribers uh, on MySpace. Google search, three years ago, every day there was about the three billion searches done. It's tenfold now, according to the study done in May. So, uh, and, and, you know, we are accustomed to, to being untethered, and we want everything and anytime, anywhere on our, any device, especially on our dear old cell phones. Uh, so this is changing the, the landscape uh, for communications. What are the implications? Um, the, um, uh, there are a lot of studies and uh, reports that you see, but uh, one of our dear customers, uh, Deutsche Telekom CEO, Rene Oberman, is saying that the iPhone uh, users use 30 times more data compared to a regular telephone or cell phone headset. So another one, uh, when uh, Verizon announced their Q3 results in late November last year, they said their data networks grew 63% year by year. And that's about considered about 20% of their service revenues. And this was like single digit until a year, year and a half ago. And it's exploding. And uh, you can see that uh, it's happening everywhere. And uh, uh, Nokia Siemens, uh, they talk about some of these new uh, development and new developing countries on the uh, Iron Curtain. There are a lot of new networks being built, and they're claiming that these uh, new HSDPA networks, that 80 percent of the, the traffic in these networks are database. So uh, the requirements are, again, it's exploding. And, you know, with that, uh, when the data traffic grows this, uh, this fast, uh, uh, you know, it's uh, really creating bottlenecks in the network. You know, voice, you know, the, every carrier has been on the mobile side, especially investing on uh, uh, voice and MSCs uh, in hundreds and billions of dollars, especially in the developing markets, India, China. Uh, like China Mobile, you know, BSNLs and uh, Tatas and so forth. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's – they realize that, you know, they have to have a new solution for, you know, to, to uh, enable this data requirements. And this realization gave uh, a new terminology called long-term evolution, which is the LTE, which is kind of synonym to, to 4G networks. And uh, – but in the meantime, uh, like if you look at China, still most of the network is in 2G. And they, you know, there are several attempts for moving to 3G, but it's not there yet. HSDPA is almost like between 3 to 4, 3 and a half, let's say, GSM. And uh, that's being deployed now mostly in Europe. Um, 
And there are, you see, commitments this year. You're hearing uh, for, you know, what uh, Akshay s- uh, told a few minutes ago. Verizon made a commitment to this. SoftBank uh, in Japan made a huge commitment for IMS. But uh, uh, the, uh, you know, it's depending on the, where their network is, when their investment is, uh, you know, we, we, uh, we are in different stages. And there are different topologies and network architectures going to be deployed uh, for a long while. And that's why I actually also present several questions. What are the alternatives today? Because one size doesn't fit all in this case. Um, on the voice side, uh, I mean, or the, gen- the revenue side, for these mobile carriers, uh, uh, if you look at it, uh, 86% of the revenues are generated by um, voice and SMS. And what that means is voice revenues are paying the bills for the development of the next generation data networks. And since these investments are, you know, if you look at the last 10 years, last decade, most of the investments were made in uh, MSCs. They haven't been depreciated yet, most of it. So you need to make sure that, you know, you, you, you have the uh, rate of return on these networks. So for, for with that, I, I think this, uh, I come to the topic for du jour. And, you know, there are ways to deliver voice today on 4G or LT networks. And Again, there are, multi, uh, there are four of them. I'm listing here three. And I'm not going to go into detail of any because I think that's the, the panel with the Q, Q&A session. We will answer that. But just summarize circuit switch fallback, Volga. This is voice over LTE, uh, which is the long-term evolution on generic access networks. And that's, that I will discuss Volga and I define what that is. And the IMS ultimate, uh, ultimate solution. On the circuit switch fallback, we all know about this, and we will answer the questions you may have. So uh, let me go to Volga. On the Volga, uh, this was created just early this year, just around uh, the Barcelona uh, Mobile World Congress time. Uh, this is basically uh, utilizing uh, the uh, current uh, voice network, and uh, which MSCs have already uh, are upgraded or invested but use uh, uh, the uh, uh, data functions through adopting uh, uh, the uh, new network elements uh, in the uh, uh, gateway. Like the gateways could be composed of a controller, uh, which is the generic access node controller. It is uh, uh, a media gateway. It's a controller. And at times, that's the security gateway composed. That's why you see, similar to a radio access node in the femtocell deployments, that's why you see that uh, the, the suppliers who adopted this and, co- and joined the force represent some of the, the leading suppliers uh, who are playing on the femto arena. And uh, uh, the, the companies that, uh, you know, that we partnered with, such as Kineto, uh, and, uh, of course, dealing with, uh, you know, the companies like NSN, er, uh, not NSN, but Ericsson, ALU, uh, Huawei, Sonus, uh, Mavenir, all adopted this, and they're working on coming up with a standard. The standard is expected to be released sometime early next year. I think it's the release 9 of the 3GPP standard, and it's, uh, I've seen the f- initial drafts working on, you know, vehemently right now to, to deliver early next year. NSN is the only large supplier who have not signed up for this. They call their service Fast Track Voice over LTE. Uh, they are saying that MSCs already have SIP signaling capability, and by just a software upgrade, that will allow them to use a VoIP traffic on, on, the, uh, on the LTE networks. And uh, uh, so that was a recent article on that, on uh, light reading. And because they were questioned why everybody is signing up but not you guys. So uh, that's where, where it stands today. The um, IMS is, of course, the ultimate choice. And uh, uh, with, with that, uh, uh, you know, there is, uh, I, I think this is the, uh, the answer for, uh, you know, all the, uh, the requirements, you know, you know, the requirement of 100 megabit downward, 50 megabit uh, the upstream. Uh, you know, you can only achieve it with, with a new infrastructure. But uh, there's no ecosystem yet. 
uh, there have been several trials, and there is a, uh, a genuine interest on going deeper uh, on this. But the technology is uh, is new. It's, it's a mature compared to circuit switch. And since you've seen 86% of the revenues are generated still on voice, you know carriers are taking this seriously and instead of moving immediately, some carriers are saying that we will use a dual structure, a parallel network if the need be. Use LTE for data networks and still, you know, circuit switch fallback or voice since, you know, again, our lifeblood is there. So, uh, but I believe eventually, you know, we will move to this because, you know, IP migration is happening, the demand is there, and if you see uh, the companies uh, talking about their uh, softer revenues this year, uh, IP is not the softest area. Uh, legacy has been. Uh, uh, so uh, with that, I think the, there's no, uh, no uh, escape from, from uh, IMS eventually. But uh, like the analog to digital, digital to soft switching t took uh, a, day, a decade and a half to go, uh, we, we will see that you know, not every network will evolve to this level and it will take time and based on where you are in the network uh, in infrastructure development. So with that, uh, I'll move, you know, give it uh, the floor to Don. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Mehmet. And I'll introduce Don uh, Trzinski from Acme Packet. Don Trzinski, IP Packet, uh, Technical Director. I've had the good fortune of working uh, with many of our uh, wireless customers directly uh, on architectural problems, solutions for their uh, 4G networks. I think Mehmet did a very good job of establishing that the LTE network is, is primarily uh, there for data in its first uh, go around. And, and uh, what we want to talk about is you know, 4G voice and why would you uh, do 4G voice? Uh, certainly, uh, we do this for the money, right? Uh, new revenue, increased margins. Uh, uh, it may be uh, a, a new application for some uh, 4G uh, providers. Um, a video certainly is a, uh, an application that would uh, integrate voice. Um, I was surprised to read a statistic that says that uh, a third of the services in uh, 4G operators today are targeted at businesses. And uh, certainly that uh, goes along with the uh, concept of higher margins for your uh, for your service and for your data. Uh, so, uh, of course, accelerate the ROI. There was a lot of investment to go into the spectrum, uh, whether you're uh, WiMAX or LTE oriented. That uh, that spectrum costs a lot of money. The more uh, you can use it uh, for more applications, certainly the, the sooner you'll return on that investment. Uh, certainly, uh, we're, we're on a panel that talks about giving voice to uh, to LTE, but. We're not quite giving it, but it's it's um, it's it's pretty inexpensive. Um, if you look at, uh, I think uh, sort of anecdotally, uh, the cable market uh, was very successful in rolling out broadband uh, to a lot of uh, different endpoints, and they realized the incremental cost of delivering voice. Once they had a very solid and reliable broadband network, the incremental cost of delivering voice over that broadband uh, was minimal. So while we're not giving voice to uh, to 4G, we're uh, we can certainly do it very cost effectively. Uh, certainly, uh, greater customer stickiness. Uh, uh, the more services you have, uh, the more they uh, they rely upon you. I think it's uh, table stakes for uh, fixed replacement, and uh, so we've seen that uh, now. Some of the 4G providers uh, are bringing along that voice product right up front uh, as as table stakes. Uh, if if they don't, somebody will. Uh, I ran into this one um, in the past week or two, uh, and if you look at it in the context of competition. Uh, there are um, there are uh, networks, 2G, 3, 3G networks out there that are uh, uh, very soon uh, going to be uh, high definition uh, voice capable. Certainly, uh, those uh, broadband, other alternative broadband networks are uh, high definition capable. Uh, you may find, as uh, depending upon the uh, uh, incumbent technology that you may have, that uh, it's easier to deliver that high definition voice over uh, a 4G technology than it is over a 3G technology, just from uh, 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 bandwidth perspective, so it could be a motivator. You may need to uh, go to 4G voice just to keep up with the high definition of your competition. Uh, we've got similar slides here. Uh, Mehmet talked about the various ways we can deliver voice over 4G. 
Um, I think we kind of pick up right there with the with the legacy UMA on the left hand side there, and this says, well, we'll just take what we have, encapsulate over uh, encapsulate over IP, and uh, and put it into uh, maybe a network controller, adapt it back to the MSC. Uh, so you're really looking at uh, a UMA type technology, and uh, you'll you'll see uh, release 99 features only uh, supported in that in that uh, environment. Uh, there are also uh, operators that are recognizing, well, yes, we do have that investment in uh, in our MSCs, and um, uh, we we also recognize that SIP endpoints are maybe easier to deploy, as we said, possibly across that uh, uh, that um, that 4G RAN, and uh, maybe cheaper to deploy. Um, so if we can just interwork those in a hybrid model, uh, we can still leverage that MSC investment while getting the uh, lower cost endpoint. And um, I think you're still, even though you may use uh, newer IP-based technology at the endpoint, you're still uh, stuck to the features. Uh, and of course, SIP or an IMS-based technology uh, would be the way to uh, to deliver innovative uh, and new features. And uh, I think there's no doubt that um, you know that's the direction that we see. Uh, uh, most operators, certainly greenfield operators, going. Um, I think I wanted to point it out, point out somewhere uh, in here that I think there's a bit of a misunderstanding about what uh, um, SIP enabling that MSC uh, really is. I think um, what we see a lot out there is um, SIP enabling on the core side, trunking side. Um, I don't think we want to do IMS in a box on an MSC. I think at that point you've uh, you've changed it to uh, to the extent that you've uh, you've already. Uh, put a lot of investment into uh, uh, what really is a, a eventually a legacy technology, um, and that would be better served in a, a pure IMS core. So why SIP? Well, I mean, truly there is no TDM or circuit switched option in uh, 4G. So IMAX or LTE, it's, a, it's an IP-based network. Uh, so really, ideally, you would look for a common signaling plane for that, uh, that ubiquitous IP access network. Um, you know, 4G wireless being one of them, and certainly any other IP-based access network could use that common signaling uh, without it looking funny. Um, certainly moving beyond voice, multimedia, video, and IM, uh, you know, we always <laughs> remind operators when they, uh, when they do deploy that, uh, that SIP or IMS-based network that now they've deployed a multimedia signaling uh, technology. Uh, it's just as easy now to uh, uh, fire up a video session, uh, assuming you've got a an IP uh, infrastructure as it is to fire up a voice session. Uh, so SIP has proven uh, to be carrier class and it has proven to be lower cost. Um, it's, uh, it's an ideal technology for a 4G operator that would prefer to uh, serve uh, rather than uh, be that, uh, that data provider. Uh, when, uh, delivery of 4G uh, voice uh, will not be without its challenges. Uh, much the same as, uh, as any IP access network. Uh, you've got IP addressing compatibilities. Uh, billing and planning uh, certainly is a big uh, component of this. Um, service element overloads. Uh, we want to have a, uh, a large uh, core that can serve a lot of uh, uh, endpoints, but uh, we certainly need to manage the signaling that goes into it. Uh, regulatory compliance um, is a challenge. Um, that's uh, intercept potentially of... Uh, of media as well as signaling. Uh, DOS attacks, uh, got a lot of bandwidth. Uh, you've got a lot of uh, bandwidth to do uh, uh, signaling attacks. Um, latency sensitive traffic, of course, we have to now consider the engineering of our, uh, maybe our backhaul or uh, uh, paths uh, that support that 4G RAN. Uh, signaling and transport protocol and compatibilities. Kind of wanted to drill down into a couple of those challenges just a little bit further. Uh, Kind of drive home the point uh, that once you do start putting uh, uh, IP-based voice onto these uh, uh, LTE networks, 4G networks, uh, you end up with uh, an addressing challenge. Uh, IPv4 supports uh, 15 million in a private address space. Um, you, know, you don't realize, I guess, or you do realize probably that that your data service on your you know on your wireless is probably natted. It's, uh, uh, made more for a client server model, but uh, you know as LTE voice uh, takes over um, in you know in the in the uh, you know in the 4G network, you now have every endpoint communicating to every other endpoint, and uh, 15 million subscribers would be the limit of a private address. Um, certainly, we could solve that with uh, V4 to V4 NATs and, and begin to stitch these domains together, but 
Now you've got multiple devices, uh, maybe in a voice call, all have the same address. So operators, it turns out, do prefer IPv6 uh, for that voice on the 4G network. Um, and, uh, and that, of course, will uh, require you to manage it. So uh, a back-to-back -back user agent within the network, within the 4G network, can, uh, can help solve that translation problem. And uh, we see that really at the, at the edge as the easiest way to manage it. If you look at all the elements in there, maybe policy servers, some switching elements, application servers, media servers, maybe enum, switching proxies, if you try to push v6 right away into all those elements, you're probably um, solving a lot more of a problem than you need to. Um, what you're really trying to do is address a lot of endpoints and v6 will give you that ability. If you convert that addressing down there at the edge, it gives you a little more freedom in that core to, uh, to hang on some of the, to, to some of the legacy elements. You won't be required to interwork as much. Um, so architecturally, we do see both ways out there where uh, ubiquitous v6 versus uh, v4, v6 at the access, v4, v6 at the, the core, but we'd definitely like to point out that uh, V6 is needed and a good place to translate it is down there at the edge. Another problem, um, of course, as you uh, try to scale up an IP-based network, and let's just say that you have you agree that uh, uh, SIP and IMS is um, your technology of choice, uh, really by distributing um, an element into that 4G network, into the access network, you'll find that uh, you can solve a lot of the challenges um, through a distributed SBC PCSCF. Uh, you have a more defined security border. Um, you'd be amazed uh, the applications now that show up on iPhones and the ability to generate uh, traffic uh, from those devices. Um, you do need a, a point of, uh, of uh, signaling control out there at the edge. Uh, you get reduced architectural complexity. Uh, you, can, you can do the translation of v4, v6. Uh, increased control availability. Um, there's also, um, you know, it, uh, you know, I, I received, I called you, but I, the phone never rang problem. Uh, you know, the, an IP network uh, requires a lot of state. A core IMS network requires a lot of state. Um, by distributing some of the elements into the access, the uh, 4G access network, uh, that can manage um, that, that state, that awareness of uh, subscribers, uh, you'll find that you're a lot more scalable and you can have a lot more accurate state with the core. Uh, so in, improved operational efficiency, of course. Uh, reduces the number of core devices required, uh, and it may help you solve some of those regulatory challenges. So that's uh, what I have today, at least as a setting of the table. Thanks, Don. Thanks. So what I'll do now is I'll open it up to uh, all you guys to see if there's any um, pressing questions you have. But years, but more than two years ago, I mean, you hear a lot about this voice call continuity, which is voice over IMS. You know, like Lucent and a bunch of other companies, they're really investing a lot in deploying a solution and offering there. Then you hear like there's some handoff, I believe, issues with the difficulties. Then I didn't hear anything for a long time. So, I'm not sure exactly if it's alive, it's dead. I mean, is it still like in progress, figuring out how to solve this handoff problem? So that's the IMS VCC, Voice Call Continuity App Server. And yeah, I whether mean, to some degree, I think it's a solution that's been, um, you know, in search of that, that real problem. There are other ways to solve it. Um, you know, I think enterprise, that sort of enterprise-oriented uh, um, handoff um, was a big, uh, a big driver, but there are other ways to solve that problem. Um, we, we heard some operators just say they didn't want another box in the network to manage, and so it's, uh, it's better to solve it with... Um, and with protocols that uh, integrate across the technologies. They just don't want another box, a VCC box. Yeah. Voice handover is generally not a major problem, but, you know, just transferring and, you know, just handling the, the setup time, so, uh, you know, in the, uh, the LT is uh, going to be an issue because it could be as high as one and a half seconds instead of okay. 10 milliseconds. Uh, so... Uh, uh, but it's a reliable system. It's what you know what's available today. So uh, you know the, the LT you know voice has to mature in order to have mass deployment. But we will get there. But today is I think that's uh, handover and packet is an issue, but not in voice. So. Yeah, I think that's a good point. There's a lot more confidence in um, uh, mobile IP to handle some of the handover. 
Yeah, I, I think part of the debate has been there's been many ways to achieve seamless handoff. You, we talked about there could be an IPPBX in an enterprise that acts like an anchor switch, and you put a client on the phone and it just talks to the anchor switch, Wi-Fi is good or Wi-Fi is bad, and it just routes the call whichever is the best way. Exactly. Or you could have it in the core with IMS. Or you could put GSM on the phone and GSM encapsulate over Wi-Fi, and the phone can, that's the UMA approach. Or, you know, there could be even alternate approaches, too. If your phone is dual mode, Wi-Fi and GSM, or dual mode, Wi-Fi and cellular, and mine is dual mode, we could even have the phones ping each other as I set it up. Is Wi-Fi good for you? Is Wi-Fi good for me? And we just go VOIP. We could go Skype, mm -hmm. theoretically. Or we go circuit switch. So we don't do a hybrid approach. You either do, you know, VOIP or cellular if there's no media gateway or core elements. So... You know, there's many ways to skin this, um, but the industry is still, you know, deciding on that. The VCC approach, as the name implies, has an IMS component. Since IMS hasn't re readily been deployed in most places, that's also part of the problem why you haven't seen that taken off. Any other questions? I'll pose a few then. If you have 10 megabit per second to a phone, if voice isn't compelling to do, let's say, FMC, is video compelling? Like the three screens vision, where the same video goes to the phone, to the laptop, and to the big screen TV, do you see a need for video FMC? Yes, I do. Because uh, I would like to see video on the headset uh, uh, used more widely, um, mm -hmm. certainly available out there. and. Uh, yeah, before we solve the you know the application problem, but uh, yeah, absolutely, um, there's a need for uh, yeah that that video. Since the users are between age 15 to 30, constitute about what 90 percent of the <laughs> uh, this high data usage, I would say yes, their expectations are they want driving. Yeah, so is it is I guess the lead-in that that drives you then towards a particular technology to implement? Uh, so the, if the if the real app is video because what a, what other application needs 10 meg to a phone? It's probably HD quality video. So should we then do a voice architecture now with video in in, in mind down the road? You know we've uh, we've seen it the other way around. We've seen a video architecture with voice in mind. Okay. I mean, it's uh, because because that's where I was saying what's the what's the technology choice? What's your what's your choice? Um, you know, say it's Greenfield or. Uh, uh, if you are looking to deliver video and you know, a SIP or IMS based voice, IP based voice is, uh, I'm sorry, video is, is really uh, uh, your, only, uh, your only choice, right? Uh, mm -hmm. So now you're going to deliver that video using an IP based technology. Now you do it with voice in mind. This question here? In fact, that's a very good point because most cell towers are T1 fed in North America, and a T1 at 1.5 meg is not going to cut it. When each subscriber is at 10 meg, and you have probably tens of or hundreds of subscribers concurrent, so that's a it's a valid point. But as you solve that problem for data, then the cost, the incremental cost of delivering that voice over that same integrated pipe now, is is so much less. It's back to that. Uh, that MSO or cable uh, industry, uh, they delivered broadband. They figured out a way to do broadband over their, you know, over their access technology, yeah. and um, 
you know, and then they solved all those problems for data, and it just made it so easy at that point then to deliver voice. And that's one of the things, you know, getting back to the IP ification, if I can use that term, of the network, okay. it's IP straight through. So now you can leverage carrier Ethernet where the cost points are a lot cheaper for, let's say, a gig e-pipe as compared to a sonnet circuit switched pipe in the past. So you can uh, benefit from that. But I agree with you that, I mean, Internet connection or getting our uh, emails are the biggest driver on these. And uh, uh, there are hundreds and thousands of, you know, locations that has only E1, T1 or sets of four in Europe typically. Mm -hmm. But some of the, uh, you know, uh, leading Western uh, countries now, Western European, have uh, been deploying uh, optical Ethernet, you know, feeds. Uh, so that's another forum discussion, but uh, that, that's happening. Even bonded copper solutions are effective. You know, companies like Cold EasyNet, the emerging CLEX are using, you know, that because, I mean, each, uh, uh, you know, copper pair, if they use uh, like a <coughs> four bonded, you can get about 40 megabits from a copper for like th two kilometers, which would be a good LAN infrastructure. So. You um, mentioned email, so on your slide here, uh, Mehmet, you have voice over IP, email, social networking. Mm. Well, there's this whole notion of unified communications and collaboration. Do you see that as being one of the trends? Well, well, well I do, because, mm -hmm. uh, again, uh, we are relying on this so, so much that on the wireless side, and... Uh, you know, we still, I mean, people like me and my generation will keep the landline, I guess, for emergency or whatever, although uh, I don't know whether it will be necessary in a few years from now. But, yeah, I unified, you know, all the things collapsed onto that is very critical. Now, there's many ways to do UUC. I mean, you can have an over-the-top search engine provider like a Google doing it with let's say an Android type device, mm -hmm. or do you see maybe it's a hybrid carrier RIM BlackBerry kind of hosted model, or is it some enterprise VPN that you tunnel through, or do you see some, some other approach? Well, uh, you know, Google type of like over the top is more, you know, kind of wireline based. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I see a hybrid. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, if you don't, somebody will, and they'll probably uh, do it reasonably well. But you know, as the operator uh, with the access pipe, I think you can do it better, right? And so there's where you know, uh, maybe video pulled through your uh, your IMS, uh, maybe these applications, uh, RCS, uh, certainly presence messaging could pull through your IMS, and then you can make that better by by integrating with voice and. Uh, Subsequently, inter integrating with voice, you know, your presence, you know, one of your presence uh, uh, indicators should be, you know, on phone. And if you're a mobile uh, operator providing that phone service, you're certainly the better, in a better position to uh, to integrate and uh, provide a better quality, uh, I think, RCS experience. With all the presence you have, you have your Google presence, you have your cellular operator presence. You know, yeah. is there going to be an aggregation? On, Google, of, on Yahoo, uh, is there know. going to be a Christmas yeah. tree effect that you have all these presents underneath <laughs> and it's <laughs> got to right. be aggregated? Yeah, question. I think that my next question is about SCARF and why you know, took out. And if you take Mark Anderson did the right thing by writing it, and what did you do in your hand going forward with Sky? Do you keep the voice only service? Do you bundle other things with it? Or how would you do Well, I'm, I'm sure they've got a challenging business model. Anybody that doesn't own the access pipe uh, you know, has to have a very compelling uh, offering as well as a way to make money. Um, I think we're. That's the key point. Yeah. It's making money. I think where eBay didn't leverage it is they could have combined it with the auction model that they have and the bidding where they could have had people actually Skype each other, interact, maybe do a reverse auction. Let's say you're a, um, you're a doctor or you're a plumber or whatever and you have three hours open. Maybe you, you provide your services at a reduced price and you have a reverse model. In fact, Mark Andreessen had that company doing that reverse auction at one time. So maybe that's what he does with this. We'll see. Or maybe Skype IP PBXs will start to proliferate and Skype clients everywhere. Any other questions? What does adding uh, 
voice to 4G geared to the device, to the handset. What challenges do the handset makers have in adding voice to those devices? So we've seen uh, certainly that V6 problem. You know, so now you've got to change your your underlying stack. Assuming you're, you know you've got an IP stack on there in the first place, right? So uh, that's taken a little more time. Uh, but if you if you adopt at least one of these technologies, you know maybe it's video delivery, maybe it's the messaging presence. You're already uh, going down the path of uh, IMS or SIP based technology, and uh, it's just a, a subtle difference now to set up uh, a call. Uh, voice call, it's obviously the same as a video call, right? So, uh, I, you know, I think once you're there for some of these uh, other applications, then, then you're there for the voice, and it's probably, I, just from what we've seen, you know, maybe the V6 uh, being the challenge, at least on the software side. Speaking as a former CTO of a smartphone company, um, there's always things like Echo, whether you like it or not. I mean, you could have Echo in the room, you know, network Echo, acoustic Echo, so these things always are there, then. So you know the, these are part of the engineering challenges. Anytime you have a delay, where 